Hello, Star Trek fans, and welcome to Season 5, Episode 1 of Rebinge Deep Space Nine. My name is James. And my name is Kim. And we're watching Star Trek Deep Space Nine from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Like James said at the beginning, we have arrived at Season 5. And today we are going to talk about Episode 1, Apocalypse Rising. It aired September 30th, 1996. The sad thing is there are fewer episodes ahead of us than behind us. That's true. We're over halfway through, but we still have three full seasons to go through. So there's still a number of weeks ahead of us before we have to figure out what to do next. Yeah, there's a little bit of time before we have to figure out which which (laughs) the next show Voyager is going to be. (laughs) The next show Voyager is going to be? (laughs) Is that a Freudian slip? Oh, could be, could be. Okay, we should probably talk about this episode. Yeah, well, before we talk about it, anything you want to say about the last episode, which was our season wrap-up? Or maybe anything about season four? I almost said season three and forgot completely what season we were on. No, it was all perfect. We had a lot of feedback, so I think now that we've arrived at the really good episodes, we're starting to get a lot more interaction from people and even more listeners. Although when I look at our numbers, I still see people are going all the way back to the beginning and listening to us from season one. And then I get these messages about how much I don't like this show. It's like, just stick with it, people. Really? Yes, I would say that. (laughs) Should we get started? Absolutely. Well, we do get a last time on summary where we see the founders turn Odo into a human or a solid, as they say. And we see Odo saying that Gowron is a changeling. And just to recap, Kim is not convinced he's really a changeling. Gowron? Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's not that I don't think he's a changeling. It's that I think the founders would lie to Odo and they would purposely deceive him because he said something about... They were hiding stuff from him? Yeah, they were like hiding faces and names from him. And I'm sorry, but this link has been around for thousands of years. I don't think it was an accident. Yeah, they have ulterior motives in everything they do. Yeah, and they're just nasty. So yeah, I think they're lying about something. Right, they're jerks. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So in the cold open, we're in ops and Worf and Kira are stressing out about Dax and Sisko having not returned from a meeting that they had with Starfleet Command. Worf is annoyed that they took a runabout and not the Defiant, but Sisko had insisted that the station needed protecting more than he did. So Worf and Miles want to take the Defiant and search for them, but Kira says she's the boss and nobody's going anywhere. But this argument doesn't matter because the runabout appears and it has been damaged, but everyone seems okay. I thought Worf's reaction here was pretty consistent. He didn't want Cisco to needlessly be at risk. Although he did seem to be overstepping a little with Kira. He did. And we don't really know what the outcome of this conversation was going to be yeah. because they appeared. And so we don't know if he was going to say, oh, I'm in charge of the Defiant, so I'm going yeah. anyway. Well, I still think that who's in charge between these two, it's a little confusing. Yeah. She was left in charge as the ranking officer. I wonder if this is more of that, but she's not Starfleet. Yeah. But also, Worf had that whole thing about how he didn't want the Defiant to be used as a guard dog. Right. But Cisco gave specific orders, and that was Kira's point. I guess it was just one of those stress of the moment kind of things. They're all on edge. Yeah. I guess so. Because immediately after this happens, he asks Kira for permission to greet Cisco. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. So once things settled, he snapped back into the proper mode. Well, he's a person of action, too. So it's probably really hard on him to just be on the station when he could be going somewhere doing things. But, you know, that's what this show is. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Did you notice how different Kira's hair color is in this scene compared to the last time on, how much lighter it was? It's several shades darker now. I didn't notice it. I wonder if I should go back and watch. (laughs) Okay, maybe just me. I wondered if she was wearing a wig at this point or what was going on there. I mean, she is heavily pregnant and maybe she didn't want to dye her hair or something. I don't know. Those are things I like to know. I like to know why. (laughs) Probably doesn't matter for the story. (laughs) You know, it could be important for the story. Kira might have been replaced with a changeling. She could have been, but probably not. So Dax and Sisko arrive in ops. Sisko says the war with the Klingons isn't going very well. Kira says it's hard to believe one changeling, meaning Gowron, could cause so much chaos. We learn here that the plan from Starfleet is to send an infiltration team into Klingon territory and do whatever it takes to prove that Gowron is a shapeshifter. Right. And Kira asks, Ugh, who are they sending for that terrible mission? And Sisko really dramatically says, me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think Kira's reaction to this would be a what? 
Yeah, definitely. Starfleet thinks it's a good idea of sending the emissary of my prophets on a potential suicide mission. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think she should have said, send O'Brien. He's used to getting tortured and captured and beaten up every week. <laughs> send Garrick. Yeah. Yeah, everything would be fine. Did we even talk about what happened to the runabout? Did anybody say what happened? They just mentioned about the damage. I wonder if that okay. was something that was cut. Yeah, because was it the Klingons? I mean, they didn't. Oh, it was weird. All right. Well, from here, we cue the theme song. So we start in Quark's and Cisco is looking for Odo. Quark says the depressed changeling is at his usual table upstairs under a dark cloud. Oh. So we find Odo waxing lyrical about the bubbles in his beer. He says at first he found the process of digestion disgusting, <laughs> which I don't know why, but that was funny. It probably is quite disgusting to be introduced <laughs> to it <laughs> as a surprise. Yes. <laughs> surprise. Anyway, he's a sad mess who is not as fulfilled by his work as he used to be. Cisco wants him to come along on the mission to expose Gowron, but Odo says he could just take anyone because now Odo is not special. He's just like everybody else. Right. But Cisco really isn't in the mood for this moping, and he says he needs his chief of security to attend the briefing at 1600 hours. I can't decide if this is either Cisco needing someone he can trust or if he's trying to give Odo something to do to prove he doesn't have to be a changeling to be a good part of the team. I feel like this mission is too important to be dragging someone along just to make them feel better. Yeah. From Cisco's point of view, when he said he needed his chief of security, I believe that's what he needs. He needs his chief of security yeah. to come along on this mission. I'm still a little cloudy on how Cisco is actually his chief of security because we did that whole thing where we brought in Snodgrass slash Eddington to be in charge of security for Starfleet. And Odo is going to be in charge of security for the station because he's really a Bajoran, yeah, yeah. I don't know, employee, <laughs> whatever they call him. So is he his chief of security? Okay, I have some headcanon here. Yeah. I expect Cisco still really wanted Odo as the chief of security, the head of security. Yeah. He now has a fantastic bargaining chip of when Starfleet complains, he can say, <laughs> well, the last idiot you sent me joined the marquee. Uh -huh. Good job, people. Right. I'm keeping Odo. Yeah, you sent me Snodgrass. So I guess what I'm saying is I don't think Cisco would bring him along just to make him feel yeah. better. I think he really, in this mission, he needs his head of security, and that makes sense. Yeah, and in this mission, you want somebody who you know is competent yeah. and has a track record of it. Right. I mean, at the same time, he must be a little bit worried that maybe he will doubt himself yeah. and not, uh, you know, maybe put himself in danger or something because he's not ultra confident. But I think on TV and in stories, there's a little bit of, well, we're going to bring him along and, you know, he's going to work it out. But in reality, if this was a real thing, would you bring him along? Maybe not. It's maybe too soon. Right. Well, he clearly is having difficulties with the transition to being a solid. Yeah, well, I would think so. Before we leave the scene, did you notice there are no Ferengi waiters in Quark's bar? I did not notice that. Well spotted. I mean, it makes sense yeah. because that happened right at the end of the season where Quark had to basically relinquish doing all business with Ferengi, which what a shame. I would wonder why would the Ferengi waiters care? They were members of a union. Yeah. Even if it was under the table, wouldn't that cause them a lot of trouble anyway? <laughs> yeah, I would think so. Look, this Ferengi stuff rarely makes sense, so... But maybe what happened was their families oh. reached out to them and said, you got to get out of there. So some pressure. Yeah, the way they pressure the family. Right, right. And I also liked on the entryway to the bar, on yeah. both sides, Brunt's little stickers oh. <laughs> where he declared yeah. that they couldn't do any Ferengi business or stuff there. At this point, take him down. He doesn't have any claim on it. Okay, we're into over analysis again. Would this be a sign of, you know, I don't care about you anymore. I now have power over you. Because remember, he frightened Brunt at the end, where he said, if you come back in my bar, you'll never leave. So now he's wearing it as a badge of honor. Right. I don't need the Ferengi Commerce Authority. I'm independent. Sure. And look, I still have a bar. What are you going to do about it? And maybe he wants other Ferengi to know yeah. that. So Because nobody else will care. <laughs> right, right. Or maybe some people who actually want to make a change or not support the Ferengi will go, hey, this is a great place to come. Like in the real world, <laughs> how you would support... <laughs> Some local business because they're behind something that you believe in or they've done something that you agree yeah. with, you know. 
Well, now we go to the briefing in the wardroom, and we learn that Gowron has relocated his military headquarters to an asteroid field deep in Klingon space. There are at least 30 warships stationed there at any given time, and there's a tachyon detection grid rendering cloaks useless, of course. Sometimes I love the convenient writing. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you can't detect cloaked ships yep. until you need to detect cloaked ships. That's a good point. What we have done before, what we did establish on TNG, is that if you were able to build some kind of a grid, you could detect them. That's true. So if they're in an asteroid field and they're in the asteroid field on purpose so that they have the opportunity yeah. to build yeah. some kind of a grid, I'll buy it. And that specifically was aimed at detecting Romulan cloaks. And this is a lone Romulan cloak. So, okay. It's um a little hand wavy, <laughs> but... <laughs> But we always have to do that. Yeah. You can't make people too powerful. Yes. Worf says getting close to Gowron will not be easy as he's closely guarded by the Brotherhood of the Sword. They're all wondering how they'll expose Gowron since he must have found a way around the blood screenings at this point. Predicted by Sisko's father. Worf proposes they just kill him because then he'd return to his gelatinous (laughs) state. And this actually makes Sisko smile. I thought that was funny. I think that's the most Klingon solution to the problem. Yeah, just stab him. It'll be fine. But Sisko does point out that their orders are to expose Gowron, not to kill him, which, you know, that's terrible. Sisko pulls out some very cheesy looking little plastic balls, which appear to be spray painted in gold. (laughs) They're modified Polaron emitters. Starfleet believes exposure to Polaron radiation will destabilize a changeling's physiology, but they have no way to test it. And they can't test it on Odo because he's not a changeling anymore. You can only expose someone to this radiation once or it's fatal, which sounds terrible. It would be a great way of like getting rid of the entire Klingon high command and all the people on the station. Just press that button a couple times. You clear it out. You win either way, I think. I have to say, even from this point, this sounded like an absolutely terrible plan. (laughs) From the first moment that they started talking about it, I mean... Wouldn't it make more sense to just shoot everyone on stun and see what happens or knock them all out with some gas and then poke them until you find the shapeshifter? I mean, what are we doing with these stupid Polaron emitters? (laughs) It doesn't seem like the best of plans. There are a few flaws in it, but I think this might have been the best (laughs) they came up with in a short time frame. Well, they obviously wanted to come up with something that required them to get into Klingon space, get close to Gowron. Yeah. They obviously were working on it from that perspective. Right. But when we get to the use of these Polaron emitters, we're going to talk about <laughs> it more because it gets even dumber <laughs> as we get <laughs> deeply into it. Well, from here, Miles does a recap and he says, so we have to get by a Klingon fleet, avoid a tachyon detection grid beam into the middle of Klingon headquarters and avoid the Brotherhood of the Sword long enough to set these ball things up and activate them in front of Gowron. And Worf says, and if we succeed, they'll sing songs in our honor, of course. Yeah. Kira wonders how they're even going to get into Klingon space safely, but Sisko has a plan and it's not a great one because in the next scene, a Klingon bird of prey is docking at the station and guess who's back? Oh, that was a great shot of... (laughs) Both the bird of prey decloaking and then it docking with DS9. I really enjoyed that. You know, I love the space shots and the models. And Oh, no, that was great. What I don't like is gold Ducat. Oh, come on. It's great to have Ducat back. Now he's like wearing a sash with like Klingon riding oh on it. Oh, my God. The sash. Oh, he's got loads of badges and medals all yes. over. Oh, he looks ridiculous with his fancy silver sash. Oh. It's like he won a beauty contest or something. It's perfect for Ducat. You realize this whole experience has just made his head twice as large. Oh, yeah, even bigger. I see Ducat as seeing himself as the savior of the Cardassian race. Oh, totally. Yeah. He thinks he's the emissary to the Cardassians. (laughs) That's a good concept. Well, he's surprised to find Kira pregnant, and he says he hopes Shakar knows how lucky he is. And Kira matter-of-factly says, Shakar's not the father. Chief O'Brien is. And then she sort of walks past him <laughs> grinning as he stands there with his mouth open. Ah, uh, that was funny. <laughs> I imagine she likes to use that sort of how Phoebe used to do on Friends when she would tell people that she was having her brother's babies. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> well, Ducat thinks this plan is suicide. Finally, somebody is paying attention. He says they'll be caught immediately. 
But then they enter the infirmary to find a bunch of Klingons, and Cisco, Odo, and Miles have been turned into Klingons. It's like we've dressed up for Halloween or <laughs> Comic Con or something. It's hilarious. Cisco and Odo look awesome, but yeah, Miles. Yeah, let's be honest. It looked like a budget <laughs> Klingon cosplay. The funny thing about Miles was you could tell it was Miles from the back because of the way he was standing. Yeah. It didn't quite translate onto Miles, but I actually thought Odo looked like he was wearing a costume. Did you? Oh. Yes. And Cisco, I thought, looked great. He looked like a Klingon. Oh, Cisco yeah. looked fantastic. And yeah. he dealt better, I think, with the teeth than the rest yes. of them. They were all sort of struggling with the teeth. That's a good point. Plus, he was having fun. Oh, yeah, clearly. As we will see as we keep going. He was enjoying himself, but nobody else was. And even Worf wasn't enjoying himself as a Klingon in this episode. I would agree. I guess that was part of the thing with Odo. He really yeah. wasn't enjoying or getting with the experience. Well, Odo would never have done something like this before. Yeah. He would have turned himself into something else. He wouldn't have been able to turn himself into a Klingon. As we've established, he wasn't good at doing people. But he's turned himself into other things, other animals. Like he said to Cisco, he would have turned into the pet Targ. <laughs> right. But now somebody's actually putting things on him to make him different. Yeah. It must just be really weird and uncomfortable to him. It's bad enough he has to wear a uniform now, right? <laughs> well, so our new Klingons are all on Dukat's Klingon ship. And he says he wants a picture of them all dressed as Klingons. That was hilarious. <laughs> Miles proposes maybe they do that after the mission. But Damar pipes up that after the mission, you'll all be dead. <laughs> he seems a little skeptical. I laughed out loud. That was funny. Yeah, I think he has the same view of Deep Space Nine plans as you do, Kim. Uh, totally. He thinks a full spread of photon torpedoes would be a better plan. Take out everybody. But Miles points out torpedoes won't penetrate the defenses. Of course. Ducat is creating false identities for everyone in the Klingon central computer system. They'll all be entered as candidates for the Order of the Batleth, where Gowron will be presiding over the ceremony of new inductees. So off we go on our ridiculous mission. And once again, we see that computer security doesn't seem to be terribly important to anybody in the future. <laughs> I think we talked about this before where this identity theft thing wasn't as common in the 90s as it is now. Right. And so there seems to be even less protection on it back then, which is funny because you, you got to believe it would happen all the time. Right. Well, now on the station, Bashir and Kira are talking about some nonsense. I didn't even write down what they were talking about. But he says she's glowing, but she doesn't feel great. She says, this is all your fault. And he says, you volunteered. And she says, after you put the idea in my head, it's a cute scene yeah. because obviously the actor here is the real father of the baby that she's carrying. But it also answers my concern that maybe nobody asked Kira for her opinion before they put the baby into her. But really not much else happens in the scene. Yeah, it's exactly what you would expect from that character. Right. That if there's a life and death situation, she's going to volunteer to do the right thing. Yeah, I'm glad they told us. Yeah. Well, back on the Klingon ship and Worf is trying to train everyone how to behave like a Klingon and it is not going well. <laughs> oh. Cisco tries to convince them that they have to shout at each other and they have to do it with their faces really close to each other. I loved how Worf was so concerned with the unklingonliness of Odo and Miles. Yes. And Odo is discouraged. He wanders away. He doesn't think he can go through with this mission. Cisco knows this has been hard on him, but brooding about it and shirking his responsibilities isn't going to make him any happier. And Odo does agree to that. Just then, an alert sounds and they rush to the bridge. So in the training scene, Cisco seems to be the only one who's really getting it. Like I said, he's enjoying himself. Yeah, I'd agree. And the other thing I take away from this is this is showing a little insight into the wonderful social mores of Klingon culture. There's a correct way to hit someone. <laughs> right. With the back of your hand or a fist. Yeah, yeah. the back of your hand, that's really yeah. insulting. You should just punch him. Yeah. That's just normal conversation. Coming on culture, if you're coming from it outside, must be just a minefield. Definitely. So we have to talk about Odo as well. I liked how Cisco did that thing where yep. he goes from very formal yep. to telling him, like it or not, you are on this mission. Right. And then 180s, totally softens his tone and works on convincing Odo that shirking your responsibilities isn't going to make you feel better. I really like that scene because I liked how Cisco works to convince people, how that character is built. Yeah. I see him being able to relate to this because he's the emissary. It's something that's being forced on him and you have to live with it. Hmm. 
And I think him taking that approach with Odo is something that Cisco deeply understands. I hadn't thought about it in relation to him being the emissary, but it definitely shows a level of emotional intelligence. That part about him saying, you shirk your responsibilities or you don't at least try, yeah. you're going to feel even worse about things later. I think that shows a real understanding yes. for someone and somebody in particular like Odo. Not that there's ever been anybody quite like Odo before. Yeah, not many people in his position, right. though. It's a good mark of leadership yeah. to be able to do kind of what you're describing, which is to talk about the realities of it. This is the thing we do. This is what we need to do. And here, let me get you on board. Right. So I like the scene as well with him. That I mean, it was a little short conversation right, that right. they had, but I did like that. Yeah. I just hope Odo is seeing that invisible counselor because this must be a nightmare for him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the realities of this are ridiculous. Even just that joke about learning about digestion. This would completely throw you for a loop right. based on how you were before and how you are now. Yeah, it'd be a mess. Yeah. Well, on the bridge, we find that we're being hailed by another bird of prey. Ducat says this happens all the time. And he says they usually project a hollow image of Ducat as a Klingon. But the hollow thing, for some reason, isn't working. Miles pulls off a panel and says the optronic relays are fused. Do you think this is typical? As it's Klingon tech, is it kind of hokey and glued together with string and a prayer? So it's breaking down all yeah. the time? I'm sure this is an old used ship and some things work yeah. well and some things don't. And also, it seems like there's just the two of them on there. Are they really able to fix this stuff? I mean... True. Well, as everybody argues about what to do, Dukat just fires on the ship and destroys it. I find it hard to believe that their shields weren't up, but okay. I think I have an answer for that. Okay. I wonder if it's Klingon arrogance. Nobody would steal mm. a bird of prey. Klingons would fight to the death to keep their bird of prey. Hmm. All right. And maybe the news wouldn't have got out that one had been stolen or one had been taken, or maybe they just didn't even know. And maybe it's not honorable to have your shields up. Oh, it's an interesting take. Uh, when you're with another Klingon. In Klingon space with another Klingon. Yeah. Yeah. That would tie up to, why do you have your shields up? Are you insulting me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, everyone is mad except for Damar, who finds it funny. I guess he's used to that with uh, Ducat. Yeah. Well, I think that's the war they've been fighting. Sneaking up behind the guy and hitting him over the head with a hammer or a photon torpedo mm. is probably the way they operate. Yeah, I guess so. I'm not sure I understand why Cisco would be annoyed. I'm making the assumption it's because of the risk of being detected. Of them shooting this ship yeah. if there was anybody else around or in sensor range? Or is he trying to avoid Klingons? I mean, technically they're at war. So one less warbird equals a win. But could it also be he's worried that it affects Worf's loyalty if they're killing other Klingons? I think there could be a couple of reasons. Yeah. And the most obvious one is, yeah, he wants to fly under the radar and blowing <laughs> up another Klingon ship is not the way to do The that. exact opposite, yeah. The other thing is, it's not the Starfleet way. and That's true. Talk yourself out of a problem. And even though they're at war, this ship wasn't attacking yeah. them. You don't know what was going on in that ship. They may have just been explorers. It could have been another group of people who weren't actually Klingons. Oh my gosh. It's just not the Starfleet way yeah. to just start shooting. That's true. So even though he looks like a Klingon in this episode, he's not a Klingon. <laughs> So we arrive at our destination, and there are a bunch of Klingon ships. Oh, that's an awesome shot. Yeah. Klingon space stations don't look as good as Deep Space Nine, but there's <laughs> ships and, oh, and asteroids. Love the space scenes. Yep. Miles and Worf are stuffing their plastic gold emitter balls into their <laughs> Klingon gloves. Ducat lets them know he won't be waiting around to be discovered. He'll be dumping them and taking off because without his hollow emitter, he's just a sitting duck. He says, besides, if you succeed, the war will be over and you won't need us. And if you fail, well, <laughs> and he doesn't finish <laughs> the sentence. <laughs> uh, so he beams them down and Cisco immediately goes into character. I like how Ducat says he hasn't survived this long by being sloppy. Yeah, that's a good well, point. I think he survived this long by luck and ability to pin your mistakes on someone else. <laughs> yeah, right. And hiding as one of your enemy in one of their ships is pretty much the reason he survived to this point. Yeah. And he's got this ship because of Kira, not because of anything smart he did. Right. I don't see Ducat's ability to survive really based on him being particularly good. <laughs> yeah, luck. Yeah. And knowing the right people, being in the right place at the right yes. time. Yes. 
Well, and even Cisco saved him before yeah. when he got thrown under the bus for something that went wrong. He's blamed for a thing that wasn't his fault. And Cisco pulled him out of that as well and saved him. Yeah. So this team has saved him a couple of times. Right. He had that falling out with Central Command. Right. Well remembered. If only I could remember what season that was in. Well, now we're in a big room full of drinking and singing Klingons, headbutting each other and being generally disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I guess this is the Hall of Warriors with the statues that Kor and the other Klingons in Blood Oath kept talking yeah. about. I thought it would be bigger, and I thought there would be more statues, and I thought the statues would be bigger. Well, they're trying to preserve some of the budget for later in the season. I guess, yeah. And there's not CGI, I guess, available to them. Oh, that's a good point. Well, Worf tells them to act like they're part of a celebration because that's what this event is. And as it's the Hall of Heroes, I love how Worf says, you can smell the blood of history in these stones. That's got to be one of the top 10 Klingon lines. <laughs> yeah, he's very dramatic. Back on the station, we see a hover cart full of baggage because we finally solved the baggage problem on this space station. Yeah. And we see Jake moping around on the second level. In my notes, I wrote, oh my gosh, he's an adult. Sirak <laughs> <laughs> is not a kid anymore. No. Bashir asks him how he's doing. He says, you can tell everyone is worried about the Klingons. Then Kira calls Bashir to get to the infirmary and help some people from an approaching ship who were injured by a Klingon attack. Bashir tells Jake his dad will be okay, because that's obviously what he's worried about. Sometimes Jake wishes his dad wasn't so good at his job, then he wouldn't get such tough assignments. He's probably right, but if he wasn't good at it, he'd probably be dead by now. So I'm not sure that's a good thing to wish for. There is also the theory that maybe Cisco ended up on Deep Space Nine because he asked for this because it was the backwater. It was the middle of nowhere. It would be nice and safe. <laughs> Thought it would be yeah. safe. <laughs> it would be an easy assignment. Surprise! <laughs> yeah, exactly. Surprise. <laughs> yeah. We go back to the Hall of Heroes and now we're dipping our mugs into a giant punch bowl. It's very unsanitary. <laughs> Some Klingon is bragging about beheading the helmsman of a starship, and he says it was a Tellarite, which is a bummer now that Jenkins yeah. Pog is my new favorite character on Prodigy. Well, anyway, they all laugh, and he calls the Tellarite a pig. So insulting. And then he brags about another kill on that ship, which irritates Sisko, and Sisko punches him. Sisko knew the person who was killed from Starfleet Academy, and he didn't like the way this Klingon was talking about him. But he just pretends it's a normal Klingon skirmish on the way to the punch Yeah, bowl. he beats the crap out of him and says, brag all you want, but don't get between me and the blood wine. And all the other Klingons yeah. like cheer, like, yay! Yeah, hooray! <laughs> oh my God, these guys. Yes. Well, Worf says Gowron won't arrive until tomorrow. Part of this initiation rite is an endurance test. Klingons are so ridiculous. <laughs> the idea is to eat, drink, and stay awake all night and still be clear-eyed when Gowron arrives for the ceremony. So they can't set the emitters up until morning. Odo thinks it's a pity that the wine doesn't have any bubbles. I mean, he's, st <laughs> he's still such a downer. <laughs> oh. Later, the fighting and the drinking are still going, and it's like an all-night kegger party from high school. Yeah. Miles says he's starting to like the blood wine, and Odo says it's not so bad, except for the taste. So he misses the bubbles, and he doesn't like how it tastes, so I'm not really sure why he says it's not bad. Well, Cisco is clearly enjoying this party. Oh, totally. He's now arm wrestling. And if you notice, he like headbutts the Klingon and then throws him <laughs> yes. to the floor. More cheering. Yes. He does say that he was captain of his wrestling team 22 <laughs> years ago. So he's got some skills from that. Oh, yeah. But he's feeling the pain of his age for sure. Yeah, he's rubbing his arm. I'm like, yeah, I can relate to that. Well, now in comes General Martok and everyone shouts and cheers. This is good news, as that means Gowron shouldn't be far behind. Yeah. Somehow, Martog doesn't recognize Worf, which makes very little sense. I mean, do all Klingons look the same to other Klingons? That feels quite off to me. Well. He toasts the crew and kind of keeps walking. Well, there's something going on, because he kind of stops, looks at he them. stops. And that's where I mm -hmm. think Cisco says, Kapla, and they do the yep. toast. So they decide to start setting up their emitters in the most obvious way possible by pulling these emitters out of their gloves and then putting <sighs> them on the statues. Yes. It is so ridiculous. Do they need line of sight? Do these? Why would they need line of sight? I didn't think it was a terrible plan, but when it came to this bit, I'm like, okay, there <laughs> might have been a better way of thinking about this and doing it. Their plan was actually to turn the thing on and put it into the arm of the statue. It's so ridiculous. 
I mean, it's emitting radiation. Why does it need to be high in the room? It's so stupid. Oh, my God. <laughs> Mistakes were made. <sighs> well, Martok interrupts Miles, saying he looks familiar, and Miles plays it well, and Martok moves on, but he is definitely suspicious. Yeah, well, he looks at him and says, did you get that Klingon outfit at a discount cosplay store? Yeah, Party City. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not a good one, dude. <laughs> And so the next ridiculous thing happens here where the crew all nods at each other very obviously and they start <laughs> setting up their balls. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Cisco, Worf, and Miles get their balls into place, but Odo drops his when someone bumps into him. And then after the ad break, Worf grabs the device from the guy that picked it up and he plays it up as a toy for children so that nobody overreacts. I was surprised that Odo didn't think more quickly on his feet here. He's still mopey. You know, maybe his game is a little off. He's definitely a fish out of water. Yeah. Well, then someone starts beating on some drums and Gowron enters. Odo still can't get his device in place because now some young Klingon climbs onto the statue for a better <laughs> view of Gowron. And by the way, where is this protection for Gowron that we heard about? I see one guy with a bat left. That was enough. Yeah. Uh, Gowron takes the stage and makes a speech with his eyes all wide <laughs> and oh. everybody cheers. <laughs> That was great. Gowron is in full Gowron mode. He's wearing the full robes. They're covered in medals. Oh. He looks absolutely the head of the council. It's yep. perfect. And Robert O'Reilly is just embracing the character of Gowron the way only he can. He's playing it up mm. just beautifully. Yeah, no, he's great in this scene, in this whole episode, yeah. And you could just imagine the Chancellor, surrounded by these yeah. noble Klingon warriors who are all heroes, would totally do the theatrics, the Klingon theatrics that we see. It's just perfect for the scene. It's so funny to look at a picture of that actor now, and he just looks like a normal person. Yeah. But that crazy thing he does with his eyes, it's Really funny. It's really tremendous. Oh, he so gets it. It's yeah. so fun to it's watch him good. play this character. And the way he uses it is very specific. Yes. You know, he doesn't overuse it. It's just used like for dramatic effect. Right, and right. when we talk about some of the things that Odo has to do with his face acting, when his face can barely move, yeah, this guy's probably the same thing. Like this was a thing that he found that he could do, even though his face was mostly covered by the prosthetics. Right. Well, now Martog starts naming off the names to come forward to get their medals, and Odo tries to chase the kid off the statue, but he won't move, <laughs> so he throws the kid down and he puts the ball up. It was, I think, in this scene where I was like, are there really only four statues in that room? That's their heroes? They have four? No, they can only fit four. They, like, rotate them through. Oh, my gosh. So we get all our balls in place, but does Cisco press the button? No. Instead, he gets called to the stage, so the name of the character he's playing anyway. He could have just pressed the button right. at that point. I did not understand why he's like, oh, and he tucks it back in his gloves. Like, come on. What was he waiting for? Garon was I standing right up on stage. If you were going to press the button, do it's it perfect. right then, right yes. when he was walking up. I could see if he if it wasn't in his hand, but yeah. he had it right in his hand. That was the chance. I think he wanted the medal. That's the only explanation that I can come up with. So question here. Yeah. Did Martog do this deliberately? Or is this list just in the Klingon version of alphabetic order? I think Martog did this specifically and on purpose. Yes. Okay. Because by this point, he'd already recognized them. I think so. So Cisco heads for the stage where Martok hits him in the back with his batleth and calls for the room to be sealed because Cisco has been recognized. Benjamin Cisco, I thought I recognized your face. But again, he, now he's laying on the floor and he's still got that thing in his hand. Now press it. I'm sitting over here. You can't see me because we're on a podcast, but I'm pressing the button. That should have been pressed. My thumb is pressing the button. <laughs> Press the button. Yes, she is. Kim is clearly very disturbed by this. Yes, come on. Ugh. Now, do you think Cisco, because he got the order of the bat last, do you think he gets to keep it? Oh, totally. I keep it. No take backs. No, it's pinned on there. You yep. can't have it back. And he needs to get a sash like Ducat now and walk around the station with a sash. Yeah. Well, he can wear it like Worf has a sash. He can He can get one of those. Yeah. I would imagine Worf's annoyed because if Worf got called first, he would have definitely worn it on the sash. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, now we're all in a holding cell. Yeah. And Martok says he was looking forward to killing Cisco on the battlefield. 
Martok chases the guards away and he tells him they've thrown their lives away for nothing. Odo says Gowron is fooling all of them. And Worf tells him to just use the emitters that they brought. But Martok says, it's too late. Gowron had their equipment destroyed. So, gee, this ridiculous plan failed. What a shocker. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. They should have tried a straight power play. <laughs> oh. That was the answer with the Klingons. That's the answer. They didn't even get a chance to hide behind a moon. Oh, man. Cisco sees that Martok is suspicious, and he admits that he's been suspicious for months. He says that Gowron changed from stopping a war to being eager for war and taking no one's counsel or advice. Odo says, well, he's taking advice from the founders. Martok says the only way to prove this is to kill Gowron. Yeah, Martok says Gowron must die. I think this is the point Worf should have like put his hand up and said, uh, see, right, this was my plan all along. <laughs> That's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> It's the Klingon way. Right. So Worf proposes that Martok challenge Gowron to honorable combat, but Martok declines. Yeah, he says there will be no honorable combat, no formal challenges. Yeah. Martok says that he'll release them and Sisko can kill Gowron. Sure. So now Martok shoots one of the guards and they knock out the other one and they head out into the hallway. Martok stabs a few more guards on the way. By the way, <laughs> Kern was devastated when he killed another Klingon just doing his duty. And here we're just doing it left and right and nobody seems bothered. Right. Okay, let's bring something else up here from Sons of yeah. Moog. How come those Klingon guards didn't look into Martok's eyes and see his intention <laughs> to kill them? Oh, God. Yeah, because that was made up. Yeah, that was made up. Now, in my rewatching, yeah. I noticed something here quite subtle. When Martok delivers that line about honor, there'll be no honorable combat, did you notice the way Odo does like a double take? Oh, no, I missed that. Yeah. Because that is quite meaningful. Yeah, they do a very quick cut to Odo turning his head and like going, huh? I did not. I missed that. So Martok stops Odo from entering the hall. He says he doesn't know where Odo's loyalties lie. I'm not 100% sure either why he did that. And that was a great bit when they walk down the corridor and Martok just pulls out his knife and stabs the two guards either side and then keeps on walking. Just keeps going. That's what I mean, though. That's not very honorable. That really isn't. It's not. Maybe that's another hint of things to come. It's another clue. So Worf, Sisko, and Miles push their way into the hall and Galron and Worf start a fight. Galron welcomes it, stopping others from attacking Worf. Yeah, well, Galron knocks another Klingon off the stage who comes to help and tells all the others, lower your weapons. If this traitor yeah. wants a fight, I will give him one. Very Klingon. Yeah, that's totally what you would expect from Galron. But while that battle rages on, Martog wonders why Sisko doesn't just shoot Galron. And then Odo realizes the reason Gowron is allowing the fight to happen is he wants an honorable fight. Yes. So he's figured out that they have the wrong Klingon. So my suspicions were correct. <laughs> the shapeshifters deceived Odo and Martog is the shapeshifter, not Gowron. But Odo has figured it out. Worf and Gowron continue to fight, but just as Worf gets the upper hand and is about to stab Gowron, Odo shouts that Martog is the changeling. And in this pause, this too doesn't make a lot of sense because there was time for Gowron to pull the knife out of his boot and stab Worf, but he didn't, and which is what would have happened, I think. You think so? Yes. Because he pauses and he's not even looking at Gowron at this point. Gowron's on the ground. Oh, yes. Okay. I mean, this was the dramatic thing again. Yeah, the dramatic pause for the yes. scene. I think they meant for that pause to be quicker than it was, but they had to kind of show it for drama. Right. We also get to see Odo the detective. Right. Figuring yep. it out. Martok's comments about honor. He calls it hardly words of a Klingon. Right. And I did like how when Odo calls him general, you can almost see the double quotation marks hanging in the air. <laughs> general. Oh. Uh. Yeah, it just shows that Odo doesn't need to be a shapeshifter to be a detective. Right. I thought that was yeah. a good scene of Odo's deductive capabilities aren't dependent on him being a shapeshifter. Yeah. It's his mind that's the important part. Right. Well, Martok reveals himself as a shapeshifter at this point by making a vine or whatever, <laughs> extending his arm. Tentacle. Yeah, making a tentacle. There you go. By, by shooting a tentacle out at Odo and wrapping it around his neck. But every Klingon with a phaser starts shooting him and the shape-shifting Martok is dead. Hey, Sisko was the first to shoot the changeling. That's true. And Sisko says, well, we found our changeling after all. <laughs> <laughs> this whole buildup was great. And the payoff 
was perfect. Yeah. Was I good. remember watching this back in the day and just being like, whoa. Yeah. And the stunt doubles worked so hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, I think this was a very good reveal. The whole thing yes. was good. I mean, I was absolutely suspicious that the shapeshifters were lying, but it, I wasn't suspicious that it was somebody else was the shapeshifter. Right. I thought there was something else going on. I also thought they gave you a bit of misdirection. They did. In Worf, what seemed like fairly easily beating Gowron. You still thought he was the shapeshifter because Worf got the upper hand? Yes. Well, you know, politicians don't always get as much practice fighting as <laughs> uh, <laughs> security officers. <laughs> Okay, good point. Although that's not what he is anymore, but but he's still practicing with Dax. Oh, yeah. Does Gowron have time to do that? I don't know. And I have some comments about this later. Oh, okay. Well, now we're in the after party, and <laughs> Gowron summarizes what's happened by saying that the changelings convinced Odo I was the spy, hoping you'd eliminate me and leave the way for Martok to take over the Empire. But really, was that the plan? Because couldn't he just have turned himself into Gowron like he turned himself into Martok? I mean... That was confusing. Okay, I think I can explain that. Oh, okay, good. I think it was because if they killed Gowron, Martog would have basically spun this as a dishonorable act by the Federation. These are the people we're fighting. They'll sneak behind us and stab oh, us in the back. That I agree with. I was thinking, why didn't... The guy who turned himself into Martog. Yeah. Why didn't he just start as Gowron? But I see what you're saying. That was actually the bigger plan was this. This yeah. was the, the giant plan. Maybe they hadn't expected as part of it to turn Odo into a solid, but they did expect that they would plant this information. I see. That would then make the Federation ultimately kill Gowron and yeah. be exposed. Okay. Okay. It's a whole thing. And be completely dishonorable in their conduct. Uh, uh, okay. The founders are sneaky. Well, that's a good plan. Yeah. That's a good plan. Yeah, yeah. No, they're sneaky. Well, anyway, if their plan had worked, then the war would have continued until both sides were so depleted that the Dominion could just easily invade. Just roll straight in. Yeah. So Cisco says we played right into their plan, but Gowron says they underestimated Odo, though, and he slaps him on the back. <laughs> that was really cute, I thought. Yes. Sisko says the only way to strike a blow is to end the war, but Gowron doesn't think it's possible. Once battle has begun, there can be no turning back. And he has to, like, insult Worf a little bit there, too, when he says it. Well, Sisko replies to that with, where Gowron leads, the council will follow. And Gowron replies, perhaps. Well. This, I thought, was very political, Sisko. He is deliberately playing into the Klingon ego, or perhaps the ego of Gowron specifically. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Knowing the right thing to say at the right time. I think he's trying to encourage Gowron by playing up to his ego. Well, sure, except Gowron knows that that's not necessarily how the Klingons work. If he goes into the council and says, oh, the war's off, they're going to be Klingon <laughs> and say, oh, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah. He does say, if you want the war to end, the Federation must allow us to annex the planets we've seized. Right. And Cisco's like, well, I wouldn't count on that. But I do think that Gowron is playing the political game too. Oh, very much so. Because he could then say, I won. See? It was a huge victory. Look at all the things that we got. Exactly. So maybe the two of them are playing politics off each other. Yes. So they finally convince Gowron that the Dominion doesn't want them to negotiate. So that's exactly what they should do. Right. Gowron says he'll call a meeting of the High Council and suggest a ceasefire. Then he says he'll send our, you know, fake Klingons plus Worf safely back to DS9. <laughs> he says, you've done a great service to the Empire. And for that, I thank you. And then he tells Worf he should have killed him when he had the chance. He says, you won't get another. Uh, I bet that whole thing stung for Gowron. Yeah, because he was about to be killed. Right. Yeah. Back to the station and Cisco's back to normal, though he says he misses the fangs. <laughs> <laughs> Bashir offers Odo any face he wants, but Odo just wants his usual face back. The end. And I think the subtext there was Odo accepting what he is now. I guess so. And realizing that he's still good at his job. Yeah, that's important, I think. So do you have any other overanalysis? Oh, one or two pieces. Uh-oh. How many pages? <laughs> so let's start off with, I think the closing scenes show that Gowron isn't, in fact, as powerful as he likes to appear. They never are. The other houses have their own agendas. Mm-hmm. Does this align with Worf's lifelong dream of the houses and the Klingon people uniting together? Mm. 
the Chancellor isn't really all powerful. All the families are still bickering with each other, fighting, trying to usurp the position of others. So even if Gowron gives this appearance of being, you know, uniting the Klingons, the only thing they can agree on is maybe fighting this war and taking these systems. Yeah. And if it doesn't fit their narrow interest, it's like, yeah, we're not listening to the Chancellor. Yeah. So I see Gowron almost as a political opportunist more than a leader. Yeah, that's fair. The Klingon government is very confusing. A mess, I would expect. <laughs> like their ships. Yeah. Because he's like the Chancellor, but he has lots of people opposing him, as we've seen many times. Yeah. He seems to have a lot of power because he could take them into war, essentially, single-handedly. See, that's the one thing I think the other yeah. families, if you sold them on the benefits of it. Oh, you'll get more mm. worlds, you'll get treasure, you'll have glorious battle. The Klingonness of it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. But it still seems so prehistoric. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's part of the problem. I guess so, yeah. Okay. Now, next thing. And this comes back to Dax and Worf play fighting in the holodecks. Did Gowron agree to this fight because Worf only had the short sword and Gowron had a full batlath? And I think this is a callback to Sons of Moog where Worf describes to Dax how a batlath often leads to a sense of overconfidence in the user. Oh. And that the Klingon short sword was much more effective. Interesting. That's a... Yeah, I think that's a great point. I thought that tied back to that conversation. I think it would make great sense that Gowron would be overconfident in that situation. Oh, I think Klingons are always overconfident <laughs> in those situations. So I think that makes sense. No, I do like that connection. Though I still say, you snap the thing in half, now you got two swords. So he still could have stabbed Worf. <laughs> he was standing there not doing anything for five minutes. It was a little dangerous, yeah. I don't think you give a Klingon <laughs> an opportunity to win. No, no, exactly. But that's, yeah, that's good. And another one. A yeah. small aesthetic view. I love how they keep on showing the interior of Klingon bridges with that soft focus. <laughs> smoky. And it seems kind of smoky. It's, <laughs> yeah. It just cracks me up. And it's red. I mean, yeah, it's pretty funny. To me, it's like, could, could somebody get an air purifier in here? It's a bit smoky. I would like it if they explained that their eyes needed something or some reason why they always did that. Right, right. Because it was the same in the Hall of Heroes was like that, too. It was kind of smoky and red. Yeah. Is there somebody yeah. smoking or just, did they just run everything on coal? I wonder if that's the implication that somebody is smoking all the time. Yeah. Next point. Yeah. Did the changeling, Martog immediately no. recognize the Deep Space Nine crew. Because when he walks in, he sort of stops and looks at them. Yeah. I assume he was just messing with Miles. He already knew who all those people were. Well, I think that's a good question. The first time through, I didn't think so. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe yeah. he, he thought they were familiar and then he stepped back and he was looking at them from a distance and then he figured it out. Yeah. But then the second time through, I did wonder that. Like, did he recognize them right away? So... How could he not recognize Worf? Worf looked exactly like Worf. They didn't change his face or anything. If they had changed his face, They fluffed maybe. up his hair a bit. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay. I think he recognized them. I would agree. Maybe not Odo, because Odo didn't look like Odo. <laughs> but I think he recognized everybody else. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah. Next one. Klingon beefs, I'm calling this. Oh. At 34.32, you can clearly see... Worf has his disruptor. So if all these Klingons in the hall are armed and there are various rivalries between the different families, houses and whatever, and yeah. drinking drunk Klingons, singing songs, maybe the wrong songs or out of key or whatever, wouldn't this be extremely dangerous yeah. that half the Klingons <laughs> would end up shooting each other or getting in fights? <laughs> They'd get into fights and yeah. Hmm. But I guess this is what the order of the bat left. Yeah. Perhaps these are all the real believers in honor and whatever their codes are. Yeah. And it's not very honorable to shoot your phaser at another Klingon. So it's likely to just be physical combat. They're not going to pull knives or guns. It's the headbutts. Yeah. Well, no, I think they would pull knives, but I don't think they oh, would really? shoot. Yeah. Okay. I just think that by morning, there'd be like a pile of dead Klingons and two guys left. Alcohol and guns is not a good mix. <laughs> so yeah, I, realistically, I think there's too much. I don't know what the equivalent of testosterone is in the Klingon physiology, but yeah. Klingosterone. The Klingosterone <laughs> and the booze 
and the headbutting. So, you know, they've all got brain damage. I mean, come on. This is not this is not a safe space <laughs> yeah. for anyone. Uh, agreed. <laughs> so let's move on to the most important thing in this episode, the changeling yeah. Martog. Okay. Why did he keep Odo behind? I, I have a couple of theories here. I don't here. know. Oh, okay. Well, tell me. The first one is he wanted Odo to escape. Yeah. And was going to help him escape because Odo's credibility would have been ruined. He'd probably be persona non gratia in the Federation because of bad intel. The question would be, is he still really working for the changelings? On Bajor, he got the emissary killed. True. So there'd be a question of his loyalty. And I think this is also backed up by the founders being just so petty and vindictive that they would do this deliberately just to hurt Odo. I think that's possible. The other reason is, I wonder if the founders still harbor some sense of belief that Odo will come to his senses eventually, and that there's still the aspect of not harming another changeling. Because if they remove Odo's friends, if they isolate Odo, eventually he'll go, okay, you guys are right. And it would be a victory for the changelings. If they could say, look, we had one changeling who strayed away from the path and even he realized his mistake and came back and it would be a propaganda victory internally for the changelings and a confirmation of their beliefs or a third option oh another option go for it they've lied to him more and they're still planning to use him oh so they don't want him to die just yet yeah and on top of that now that we've seen how large and complex their conspiracies are Yeah, yeah Now that I've seen this episode, they also could be thinking that this punishment of turning him into a humanoid, that this is temporary because it's going to be so awful, he's going to want to come back. Exactly. And they're going to turn him back into what he is. So I think it could all be linked together. Like this this whole plot, part of it was we turn Odo into a humanoid. We plant these things in his memory. Yeah. And when the circle comes back together, yeah. so the end of the story is, and then we bring him back into the fold and he will see how fantastic it is to be a changeling again. So I think it's part of the story. And he'll want to come back. He'll he'll beg to come back. Ooh. All three of those parts then come together. Right. Nice. Those founders are jerks. <laughs> As we've established. They are not the nice people in this, this storyline. No, they just torture Odo. I mean. Oh, completely. It's just, just, just awful. Next thing. And this is my second from final one. Okay. Why did Martok Changeling go all shapeshiftery? Did he think his cover was blown? Or did he hate Odo so much that it got the better of him? Oh. That it was like, I'm going to kill Odo no matter what. He's blown the whole thing. Because there was no proof yet. Yeah. He showed the proof by turning into the Changeling. Right. If Martok... That's a good had point. stood there and shouted at all the Klingons that these traitors and yeah, these infiltrators them. are trying to kill Gowron. And... They're not even Klingons. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good point. My take on that is that that founder hated Odo so much that it basically he made irrational choices and tried to kill Odo. Well, that ruins the plan, if that's true. It ruins the big plan yeah. if they were trying to save Odo to bring him back. Well, but it would have made sense at that point if Odo had done something like stabbed him or something yeah. to make him turn into the shapeshifter. But I guess I don't have the answer. I took it down to it was an emotional response by the founder. Hmm. Okay. And my final point. Yeah. Is Odo now in even deeper water? Because at the end of the day, he basically got another changeling killed. <laughs> Well, he definitely didn't do this one. He didn't fire. He didn't do anything to cause it. He exposed him and put him in a position where he would get killed. But he didn't harm him. That almost sounds like a founder's excuse. (laughs) I didn't actually kill him. I mean, okay, yeah. (laughs) But I did expose him. Yeah. No, I don't. Yeah. It feels different. He didn't have his hands on him. You know what I mean? Yeah. I looked at it as more like they would see this as Odo being treacherous. Yeah, the haters will still hate. Yeah. It's just another reason to to dislike Just another him. reason, exactly. Yeah. And I think with that, haters gotta hate. That wraps up my over-analysis. <laughs> There's the alternate title for the episode. <laughs> haters gotta hate. Klingons gotta Klingon. Could also be that. Over to you, Kim. 
I have two sentences in my over analysis section. Go. The first one says, I feel like we played up this Brotherhood of the Sword thing and then it wasn't anything. There was like one guy with a bat left and we never saw it again. Maybe the Brotherhood of the Sword were all the guys that Changeling Martog killed. Oh, the ones who were out in the hallway? Yeah. Hmm. Like the guards. Oh, they weren't very good. <laughs> they weren't very good at their jobs. Maybe that's <laughs> the secret. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, he could have changed them all out for terrible ones, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a right. really good point. That's quite believable. All right. And then my second sentence in over analysis is I knew those jerks were lying to Odo. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I so wanted to tell you that, yep, you have it on the nose. And at the time, I didn't see it. I was totally surprised with this episode. I thought it was great. I thought they led us down this path beautifully. And then, boom, this episode came out. And it was like, wow, did not see that. I kind of thought we were going to see that both of them were yeah. changelings. I did have that thought a few times. That's like, oh, maybe both of them are shapeshifters. Garan and Martok. Right. But anyway, that, that's all that I had in my over analysis. <laughs> I think we covered everything else. So let's go to women in the future. Not a lot to talk about, obviously, because it's a Klingon episode. There were a few women in that hall, yep. uh, but this was primarily a bunch of dudes like having a frat party or something. <laughs> it's so interesting that women can get this commendation, but they can't serve on the high council. It didn't fit, does it? No, I, but then I also was like, is this just a rule for this TNG era? Because that's where they said it. Yeah. You know, Gauron is the one who said it. But I swear there were women on the High Council in Star Trek VI, the movie. So it just seems like they don't have that quite straightened out. Yeah. <laughs> it's a weird rule and it's inconsistent. And I don't quite like that, but who knows? Yeah, because I think I counted four mm. women in the hall. Yeah. It's definitely women there. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to rating. Thumbs up, thumbs down, or neutral. What is your rating? Absolutely love this episode. Even in the rewatches, knowing what happens at the end, still thoroughly enjoy it. So much good Cisco, so much great Klingons, a lot to like in this episode. And you see Odo kind of finding his place in the world. Yeah, I agree. Thumbs way up. What a fun start to the season. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I laughed. <laughs> it was entertaining. Yes, there's some big holes in this ridiculous plot that they had, the Deep Space Nine plan, but it was a great episode. Really fun. It was a great plan for a Deep Space Nine plan. <laughs> well, the plan didn't work. Something else worked. Well, it usually works out. I, <laughs> yeah. They should have run some simulations on the Hollow Suites or something. Yeah. At the time, I remember being excited to see this episode because so much happened at the wrap up of season four. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. This was just a stunning opening to season five. I admit I did think Odo was going to go back to being a changeling in this episode. Yeah. Not anything to do with this particular episode, but when we ended season four, yeah. I thought, oh, he'll be back to <laughs> being a changeling in the first episode because that's what episodic television does. Right, right. Well, look at Miles. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Well, okay, I guess that wraps up Season 5, Episode 1. Come back next week for Episode 2. In the meantime, if you'd like to send us your own over-analysis of this or any episode, or if you just want to say something nice, you can email us at rebingeit at gmail.com or tweet us at rebingeit. We're also on Instagram and YouTube at rebingeit. You can check us out on talkthroughmedia.com. You can leave feedback there for individual episodes. You can also go to talkthroughmedia.com slash feedback and leave general feedback, including a voicemail if you'd like to leave it. And also on talkthroughmedia.com, you will find all of our other podcasts, including Star Trek Prodigy, a rebingeit podcast that James and I do. We have a Discovery podcast. We have a Picard podcast. And of course, we have a Lower Decks podcast. And when Strange New World starts, we will have a podcast for that. Thanks for joining us on the new season of Rebinge Deep Space Nine. That's it for me. And that's it for me. 